Medieval warfare is the warfare of the Middle Ages. In Europe, technological, cultural, and social developments had forced a dramatic transformation in the character of warfare from antiquity, changing military tactics and the role of cavalry and artillery. In terms of fortification, the Middle Ages saw the emergence of the castle in Europe, which then spread to southwestern Asia. Strategy and Tactics Dere Militari, si vis pacem, para bellum if you want peace, prepare for war vegetius, Dere Militari, preface to book 3. Publius Flavius Vegetius Renatus wrote Dere Militari possibly in the late 4th century. Described by historian Walter Goffet as the Bible of warfare throughout the Middle Ages, Dere Militari was widely distributed through the Latin West. While Western Europe relied on a single text for the basis of its military knowledge, the Byzantine Empire in southeastern Europe had a succession of military writers. Though Vegetius had no military experience, and Dere Militari was derived from the works of Cato and Frontinus, his books were the standard for military discourse in Western Europe from their production until the 16th century. Dere Militari was divided into five books, who should be a soldier and the skills they needed to learn, the composition and structure of an army, field tactics, how to conduct and withstand, sieges, and the role of the navy. According to Vegetius, infantry was the most important element of an army because it was cheap compared to cavalry and could be deployed on any terrain. One of the tenets he put forward was that a general should only engage in battle when he was sure of victory or had no other choice. As archaeologist Robert Lydiard explains, pitched battles, particularly in the 11th and 12th centuries, were rare, although his work was widely reproduced, and over 200 copies, translations, and extracts survive today. The extent to which Vegetius affected the actual practice of warfare as opposed to its concept is unclear due to his habit of stating the obvious. Historian Michael Clanchy noted the medieval axiom that laymen are illiterate and its converse that clergy are literate. So it may be the case that few soldiers read Vegetius a work, while their Roman predecessors were well educated and had been experienced in warfare. The European nobility of the early medieval period were not renowned for their education. However from the 12th century it became more common for them to read. Some soldiers regarded the experience of warfare as more valuable than reading about it. For example, Geoffroy de Charny, a 14th century knight who wrote about warfare, recommended that his audience should learn by observing and asking advice from their superiors. While it is uncertain to what extent his work was read amongst the warrior class as opposed to the clergy, Vegetius remained prominent in the literature on warfare in the medieval period. In 1489, King Henry VII of England commissioned the translation of De Re Military into English. So every gentleman born to arms and all manner of men of war, captains, soldiers, Vitulas and all others would know how they ought to behave in the feats of wars and battles. Employment of force the infantry, including missile troops, would typically be employed at the outset of the battle to break open infantry formations while the cavalry attempted to defeat its opposing number. If the cavalry met foot soldiers, the pikemen would engage them. Perhaps the most important technological advancement for medieval warfare in Europe was the invention of the stirrup. It most likely came to Europe with the Avars in the 7th century, although it was not properly adopted by the major European powers until the 10th century. Fortifications In Europe, breakdowns in centralized power led to the rise of a number of groups that turned to large-scale pillage as a source of income. Most notably the Vikings raided significantly, as these groups were generally small and needed to move quickly. Building fortifications was a good way to provide refuge and protection for the people and the wealth in the region. These fortifications evolved over the course of the Middle Ages, the most important form being the castle, a structure which has become almost synonymous with the medieval era in the popular eye. The castle served as a protected place for the local elites, 
Inside a castle they were protected from bands of raiders and could send mounted warriors to drive the enemy from the area, or to disrupt the efforts of larger armies to supply themselves in the region by gaining local superiority over foraging parties that would be impossible against the whole enemy host. Fortifications were a very important part of warfare because they provided safety to the lord, his family, and his servants. They provided refuge from armies too large to face in open battle. The ability of the heavy cavalry to dominate a battle on an open field was useless against fortifications. Building siege engines was a time-consuming process and could seldom be effectively done without preparations before the campaign. Many sieges could take months, if not years, to weaken or demoralize the defenders sufficiently. Fortifications were an excellent means of ensuring that the elite could not be easily dislodged from their lands, as Count Baldwin of Hainaut commented in 1184 on seeing enemy troops ravage his lands from the safety of his castle. They can't take the land with them. Siege warfare in the medieval period besieging armies used a wide variety of siege engines including scaling ladders, battering rams, siege towers and various types of catapults such as the mangonel, onager, ballista, and trebuchet. Siege techniques also included mining in which tunnels were dug under a section of the wall and then rapidly collapsed to destabilize the walls. Foundation. A final technique was to bore into the enemy walls, however this was not nearly as effective as other methods due to the thickness of castle walls. Several of these siege techniques were used by the Romans but experienced a rebirth during the Crusades. Advances in the prosecution of sieges encouraged the development of a variety of defensive countermeasures. In particular, medieval fortifications became progressively stronger, for example, the advent of the concentric castle from the period of the Crusades, and more dangerous to attackers, witness the increasing use of machicolations, and murder holes, as well the preparation of hot or incendiary substances. Arrow slits, concealed doors for sallies, and deep water wells were also integral to resisting siege at this time. Designers of castles paid particular attention to defending entrances, protecting gates with drawbridges, portcullises and barbicans. Wet animal skins were often draped over gates to repel fire. Moats and other water defenses, whether natural or augmented, were also vital to defenders. In the Middle Ages, virtually all large cities had city walls. Dubrovnik in Dalmatia is an impressive and well-preserved example, and more important cities had citadels, forts or castles. Great effort was expended to ensure a good water supply inside the city in case of siege. In some cases, long tunnels were constructed to carry water into the city. In other cases, such as the Ottoman siege of Shkadre, Venetian engineers had designed and installed systems that were fed by rainwater channeled by a system of conduits in the walls and buildings. Complex systems of underground tunnels were used for storage and communications in medieval cities like Tabor in Bohemia. Against these would be matched the mining skills of teams of trained sappers, who were sometimes employed by besieging armies. Until the invention of gunpowder-based weapons, the balance of power and logistics definitely favored the defender. With the invention of gunpowder, the traditional methods of defense became less and less effective against a determined siege organization. The medieval knight was usually a mounted and armored soldier, often connected with nobility or royalty. Although knights could also come from the lower classes, and could even be unfree persons. The cost of their armor, horses, and weapons was great. This, among other things, helped gradually transform the knight, at least in Western Europe, into a distinct social class separate from other warriors. During the Crusades, holy orders of knights fought in the Holy Land. Heavily armed cavalry, armed with lances and a varied assortment of hand weapons played a significant part in the battles of the Middle Ages. The heavy cavalry consisted of wealthy knights and noblemen who could afford the premium equipment, and non-noble squires employed by noblemen. 
Heavy cavalry was the difference between victory and defeat in many key battles. Their thunderous charges could break the lines of any but the most disciplined pike formations, making them a valuable asset to all medieval armies. Light cavalry consisted usually of lighter armed and armored men, who could have lances, javelins or missile weapons, such as bows or crossbows. In much of the Middle Ages light cavalry usually consisted of wealthy commoners. Later in the Middle Ages light cavalry would also include sergeants who were men who had trained as knights but could not afford the costs associated with the title. Light cavalry were used as scouts, skirmishers or outflankers. Many countries developed their own styles of light cavalry, such as Hungarian mounted arches, Spanish genetes. Italian and German mounted crossbowmen and English curraws. Infantry were recruited and trained in a wide variety of manners in different regions of Europe all through the Middle Ages, and probably always formed the most numerous part of a medieval field army. Many infantrymen in prolonged wars would be mercenaries. Most armies contained significant numbers of spearmen, archers and other unmounted soldiers. Recruiting in the earliest Middle Ages it was the obligation of every noble to respond to the call to battle with his own equipment, archers, and infantry. This decentralized system was necessary due to the social order of the time, but could lead to motley forces with variable training, equipment and abilities. The more resources the noble had access to, the better his troops would typically be. Typically the feudal armies consisted of a core of highly skilled knights and their household troops, mercenaries hired for the time of the campaign and feudal levies fulfilling their feudal obligations, who usually were little more than rabble. They could, however, be efficient in disadvantageous terrain. Towns and cities could also field militias. As central governments grew in power, a return to the citizen and mercenary armies of the classical period also began. As central levies of the peasantry began to be the central recruiting tool, it was estimated that the best infantrymen came from the younger sons of Frelandoning yeomen, such as the English archers and Swiss pikemen. England was one of the most centralized states in the late Middle Ages and the armies that fought the Hundred Years' War were mostly paid professionals. In theory, every Englishman had an obligation to serve for 40 days. 40 days was not long enough for a campaign, especially one on the continent. Thus the scutage was introduced, whereby most Englishmen paid to escape their service and this money was used to create a permanent army. However, almost all high medieval armies in Europe were composed of a great deal of paid corps troops, and there was a large mercenary market in Europe from at least the early 12th century. As the Middle Ages progressed in Italy, Italian cities began to rely mostly on mercenaries to do their fighting rather than the militias that had dominated the early and high medieval period in this region. These would be groups of career soldiers who would be paid a set rate. Mercenaries tended to be effective soldiers, especially in combination with standing forces, but in Italy they came to dominate the armies of the city-states. This made them problematic, while at war they were considerably more reliable than a standing army. At peacetime they proved a risk to the state itself like the Praetorian Guard had once been. Mercenary on mercenary warfare in Italy led to relatively bloodless campaigns which relied as much on maneuver as on battles. Since the condottieri recognized it was more efficient to attack the enemy's ability to wage war rather than his battle forces. Discovering the concept of indirect warfare 500 years before Sir Basil Liddell Hart, and attempting to attack the enemy supply lines, his economy and his ability to wage war rather than risking an open battle, and maneuver him into a position where risking a battle would have been suicidal. Machiavelli understood this indirect approach as cowardice. Equipment Weapons Medieval weapons consisted of many different types of ranged and hand-held objects. Battle axe horsemen's pick. Blades arming sword dagger knife longsword messer. Blunt weapons club flail mace warhammer. 
Polearm halberd lance military fork, the weaponized pitchfork polax spear, ranged bow longbow crossbow throwing axe throwing spear and javelin sling, armor body armor leather fabric chainmail brigandine plate, shield, helmet, artillery and siege engine battering rams, catapult, trebuchet, ballista, siege tower, animals camels in warfare, dogs in warfare, Horses in warfare and horses in the Middle Ages. War elephant. War pigs. Relics. The practice of carrying relics into battle is a feature that distinguishes medieval warfare from its predecessors or from early modern warfare. The presence of relics was believed to be an important source of supernatural power that served both as a spiritual weapon and a form of defense. The relics of martyrs were considered by St. John Chrysostom much more powerful than walls trenches, weapons and hosts of soldiers. In Italy, the character or caro della guerra, the war wagon, was an elaboration of this practice that developed during the 13th century. The caro della guerra of Milan was described in detail in 1288 by Bondesen de la River in his book on the Marvels of Milan. Wrapped in scarlet cloth and drawn by three yoke of oxen that were caparisoned in white with the red cross of St. Ambrose, the city's patron, it carried a crucifix so massive it took four men to step it in place, like a ship's mast, supplies and logistics, plunder and foraging supply trains famine and disease naval warfare. The waters surrounding Europe can be grouped into two types which affected the design of craft that traveled and therefore the warfare. The Mediterranean and Black Seas were free of tides, generally calm, and the weather predictable. The seas around the north and west of Europe experienced stronger and less predictable weather. The weather gauge, the advantage of having a following wind, was an important factor in naval battles, particularly to the attackers. Typically westerlies dominated Europe, giving naval powers to the western advantage. Medieval sources on the conduct of medieval naval warfare are less common than those about land-based war. Most medieval chroniclers had no experience of life on the sea, and generally were not well informed. Maritime archaeology has helped provide information. Early in the medieval period, ships in the context of warfare were used primarily for transporting troops. In the Mediterranean, naval warfare in the Middle Ages was similar to that under late Roman Empire. Fleets of galleys would exchange missile fire and then try to board bow first to allow marines to fight on deck. This mode of naval warfare remained basically the same into early modern period, as, for example, at the Battle of Lepanto. Famous admirals included Roger of Loria, Andrea Doria and Hay Red and Barbarossa. Galleys were not suitable for the colder and more turbulent North Sea and Atlantic Ocean, although they saw occasional use. Bulkier ships were developed which were primarily sail-driven. Although the long lowboard Viking-style road long ships saw use well into the 15th century, their main purpose in the north remained the transportation of soldiers to fight on the decks of the opposing ship. Late medieval sailing warships resembled floating fortresses, with towers in the bows and at the stern. The large superstructure made these warships quite unstable, but the decisive defeat that the more mobile but considerably lower boarded longships suffered at the hands of high boarded cogs in the 15th century ended the issue of which ship type would dominate northern European warfare. Introduction of guns The introduction of guns was the first steps towards major changes in naval warfare, but it only slowly changed the dynamics of ship-to-ship -ship combat. The first guns on ships were introduced in the 14th century and consisted of small wrought iron pieces placed on the open decks and in the fighting tops often requiring only one or two men to handle them. They were designed to injure, kill or simply stun, shock and frighten the enemy prior to boarding. As guns were made more durable to withstand stronger gunpowder charges, they increased their potential to inflict critical damage to the vessel rather than just their crews. Since these guns were much heavier than the earlier anti-personnel weapons, they had to be placed lower in the ships, and fire from gun ports. 
to avoid ships becoming unstable. In Northern Europe the technique of building ships with clinker planking made it difficult to cut ports in the hull. Clinker-built ships had much of their structural strength in the outer hull. The solution was the gradual adoption of carvel-built ships that relied on an internal skeleton structure to bear the weight of the ship. Gun ports cut in the hull of ships weren't introduced until 1501. At the very start of the early modern period the first ships to actually mount heavy cannon capable of sinking ships were galleys, with large wrought iron pieces mounted directly on the timbers in the bow. The first example is known from a woodcut of a Venetian galley from 1486. Heavy artillery on galleys was mounted in the bow which fit conveniently with the long-standing tactical tradition of attacking head on them. Bow first. The ordnance on galleys was quite heavy from its introduction in the 1480s, and capable of quickly demolishing medieval-style stone walls that still prevailed until the 16th century. This temporarily upended the strength of older seaside fortresses, which had to be rebuilt to cop with gunpowder weapons. The addition of guns also improved the amphibious abilities of galleys as they could assault supported with heavy firepower, and could be even more effectively defended when beached stern first. Galleys and similar oared vessels remained uncontested as the most effective gun-armed warships in theory until the 1560s and in practice for a few decades more, and were actually considered a grave risk to sailing warships.